Good Friday. Not just a good Friday, though, a great Friday. Because though our Lord died today, Christ was crucified for you and for me and for the world. We follow along with our order of worship as it's printed out for you in the bulletin, noticing that there are some differences between this service and the evening service, following along with the one o'clock service time. Parents are requested following the opening anthem to please stand so that your child can see you and get back to you and find you in the pew a little bit more smoothly. We continue with the anthem.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Our iniquities have separated us from our God. At one time, we were separate from Christ. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy and merciful Lord, we confess that we were born sinful, banished from your presence. We have failed to carry out your law and even actively broken your commands. We are not worthy to approach you or to see your face. For our wrongs against you and our neighbor, we deserve to be separated from your goodness forever. Have mercy on us. You who were once far away have now been brought near through the blood of Christ. He is our peace. He reconciled all people to God through the cross. Through him, we have access to the Father by one spirit. As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats for the lessons. Our first lesson for today is taken from Leviticus chapter 16. We humans could not enter the most holy place in God's presence without sacrifice for sin on the Day of Atonement. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place, behind the curtain, in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die, because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household, and he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and with his finger sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites. 
whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson is taken from Hebrews chapter 6. We have a secure hope in Jesus who went before us into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain as our high priest. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of our God.
Please stand. The gospel for today is taken from Luke chapter 23. When Jesus died, the temple curtain was torn and the way to paradise was open. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated for our next hymn.
mercy, and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. The plotting and the payoff and the betrayal, the angry mob gathered shouting, Crucify! Crucify! The false witnesses that came forward in a trial under the cover of night, the governor who condemned an innocent man in order to save his own skin, the inhumane treatment of a prisoner being mocked and beaten and tortured, all of the religious leaders all the way down to other convicted criminals hurling insults at a dying man, the great healer, wounded, bleeding, hanging, giving up his spirit. With all of the injustices and the indecency that happened on Good Friday, a person could rightly ask, is there any hope for humanity? And today, the same question could be asked. With lying and denial, with hatred and violence, with human trafficking, with millions being murdered before they even see the light of day, with broken promises, corruption, conspiracy. People today could still ask the same question, is there any hope for humanity? Yet today, from this section of God's word in Hebrews chapter 6, the Lord wants you and me to have a hope that we can flee to, a hope that we can hold on to and never let go. He says, hold on to this hope. It's hope that's anchored in God's promises. It's also hope that advances beyond the curtain. The Christians who first read this letter to the Hebrews that we now know as the letter to the Hebrews, they were feeling like they were in the middle of a storm with waves being blown this way and that out on the sea. Those Christians, they had seen several people, some of them, some other Christians, imprisoned, their property confiscated. They went through public insults and persecution. And just being associated with Christianity at that time was growing more and more uncomfortable. They were tempted to jump ship and go back to Judaism, to go back to Old, Old Testament relationship with the Lord. And today, we do have something in common with them. Because oftentimes, we are tempted to give up our hope too. With various storms in our life, things that batter and beat away at us, what is it for you? Has the death of a loved one made you feel like you're all alone, out on turbulent waters? Has a family split or a job loss made you feel like you're being beaten back and forth, rolling from one end of the ship to the other? Has the growing unpopularity of Christianity in our culture made you want to look for smoother sailing in some other worldview? Has your relationship with family members or friends made you feel like you're being beaten by wind and pelted with heavy rain? Do the various mistakes and failures in, in your life make you feel like a tidal wave of guilt is about to sweep over you. What is it that threatens to capsize your hope, and threatens to shipwreck you in your life? This letter to the Hebrews, these words right here, say that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Back in the early Christian church, Back in the Roman world, an anchor was a very important symbol of hope for those out at, out at sea. The Apostle Paul, as he was sailing to Rome on a ship as a prisoner, they encountered a very serious storm called a Northeaster. They thought that the ship was going to split apart. 
They were being driven along. They had lost control completely. They didn't see the sun or the stars for days at one time, but they did have an anchor. They let that anchor down, and the Lord used that anchor to help keep Paul and the rest of the crew safe. An anchor. That's what we have for our soul, firm and secure. This section talks about these promises of God. How he not only promised, but he also gave an oath. He swore by himself. It's not just one promise, but it's a double guarantee. Extra certainty from the Lord. The Lord's promise to Abraham was that you'll be blessed and you'll have many descendants. Abraham didn't see that for a long time. In fact, he never saw those descendants in this life more than the stars in the sky. Just saw that one child of the promise, Isaac. He held on to that hope as an anchor for his soul, firm and secure. God's promise to you and to me is that we are part of those descendants of Abraham. Because we who put our trust in the same promises, we who put our trust in the same God of Abraham, are children of Abraham, descendants of Abraham. And when Christ died on the cross, that was God saying, he is the descendant. He is that descendant of Abraham through whom I will bless all nations. Jesus is that descendant who paid for the sins of the world, who has forgiven your sins, you and your children and all who are far off. He is the blessing for you. To have that hope as an anchor for our souls, whenever doubt comes up, whenever guilt comes at us, whenever difficulty comes toward us in our life, Hold on to that anchor. It's been discovered on the tombs of Christians in Rome from the early Christian church. They have little etchings of an anchor, a little symbol in those catacombs. Those early Christians viewed their promises from God as an anchor for their soul, firm and secure. That's an anchor that you and I have too as we face death knowing that we are forgiven, we are blessed, we have this double guarantee in the promises of our God through Christ on Good Friday. Whenever you're losing hope, whenever you're wondering or doubting in life, let down that anchor. Lower the anchor of God's promises and know that you are firm and secure there. Hold on to that hope Hope anchored in God's promises, but also hope that advances beyond the veil. In the tabernacle and in the temple, there was a thick curtain that blocked the way into the presence of God, that blocked the way into the most holy place, the innermost room of the tabernacle and the temple. In the Torah, it's mentioned in the Old Testament that that curtain was made of scarlet, and purple and blue fabric twisted together with cherubim woven into it by a skilled craftsmanship. Those cherubim can remind people of the cherubim God stationed at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve sinned, they were banished from the Garden of Eden. And God stationed cherubim there with a flaming sword flashing back and forth banished from God's presence, banished from paradise, separated from God. That's what the curtain reminded people. And you couldn't just approach God on your terms. It had to be on his terms. That's why in the first lesson we heard about Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu. They tried offering unauthorized fire before the Lord. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed them. They died because they tried to approach the Lord on their own terms. Two sinful human beings. No sinful human being. Not even an Israelite. Not even a priest. Not even a Lutheran. Not even a called worker can approach the Lord on their own. That curtain was a reminder. It separated you from your God. Your sins. 
there in the most holy place, God appeared in a cloud above the Ark of the Covenant. But on Good Friday, when Jesus was crucified, that temple curtain ripped in two from top to bottom. That's pretty significant because it ripped from from the top all the way down to the bottom. It was a thick curtain. couldn't be ripped just by human hands. It was the Lord's doing. It was ripped from top to bottom, not from side to side or diagonally as if the gravity had just pulled away at it or some human being was hanging on it. No, it was the Lord's doing that this temple curtain was ripped in two. It's only because of Jesus, our great high priest. He went ahead of us. This is such a big deal because it means that you and I, through Christ and his death on the cross, we can go beyond the curtain. We go beyond the curtain into the presence of God. We can stand there confident and forgiven. We can go beyond the curtain and expect that God will provide for us and protect us. We can go beyond the curtain and know that the way to paradise has been opened for us. We can go beyond the curtain. We know we will see God face to face with our own eyes, we and not another. How our heart yearns within us. We can go beyond the curtain and we know that we will live in glory with the Lord in his presence forever. Only through Christ Only through his sacrifice, our great high priest. Not through the Ten Commandments. Not through four noble truths. Not through five pillars. Not through six steps of the scientific method. Only through Christ, our great high priest, we go beyond the curtain into the presence of God, redeemed and forgiven. Do you notice how this section of scripture speaks about hope? Christian hope is different than the way the word hope is usually used. We might say, oh, I hope the Brewers win the World Series this year. Or I hope our farmers have a bumper crop. We might say, I hope it doesn't snow anymore this spring. And those things, they may happen. Some of them may be more likely than others, but I wouldn't stake my life on it. Yet a Christian can stake their life on this hope. Christian hope is complete certainty based upon past fact. Because Christ has gone ahead of us, behind the curtain, into the most holy place. With his blood, with his sacrifice, we know that we too have confidence before our God. On Good Friday... Several miracles happened when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Darkness covered the land for three hours in the middle of the day. The earth shook and the rocks split apart. Saints rose from the dead and then later on went and appeared to people. The temple court curtain was torn in two. All these miracles, they didn't happen just to amaze people. They didn't happen just to make people wonder, what was that all about? Those miracles happened so that we have hope. True hope. Hope that we can run to. Hope that we can hold on to. Hope that's anchored in God's promises. Hope that advances beyond the veil. Hope for us. Hope for the whole world. Hope for all who put their trust in Christ. It's hope for today. Hope for tomorrow. And hope for eternity. Hold on to this hope. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue by singing the sermon response, Lamb of God.
take your seats for the offering. Please stand for prayer. Jesus, from the cross you prayed to your Father that he would forgive those who crucified you. What mercy, even toward those who were so hostile. You ask this forgiveness also for us, who by our attitudes have led you to be mocked and spit upon and nailed to a cross. By your cross you have traded our hatred for your peace. Help us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. Jesus, 
Jesus, on the cross you promised paradise to the criminal who feared God and looked to you in faith. Lead us to realize that if we had been sentenced to the cross, we would have been punished justly. Yet you were innocent. On our last day in this world, help us to call on you. Remember us when you come into your kingdom and receive us by faith into the joys of paradise. you have given the blessing of family and friends. Even as you suffered on the cross, you sought to provide for your mother and the disciple you loved. By those words of love, you have made us your brothers and sisters. Give us a spirit of kindness and care toward our own families and toward the family of believers. Since the beginning, you were with God and you are God. Yet on the cross, you were forsaken by the Father in our place. You experienced such darkness, loneliness, and pain so that we will never have to. Because you were abandoned on Calvary, we can be confident that you are with us always to the very end of the age, no matter where we are. On the cross, you experienced great thirst. Your tongue stuck to the roof of your mouth, and your strength dried up as broken pottery. Yet as your blood was spilled and as your life was evaporating, you were preparing a spring of living water for us that we might drink and never thirst again. Help us always to trust in you so that streams of living water may flow from within us. Since Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, so much was left undone by your people. We have failed to carry out the love you command us to show toward you and our neighbor. Yet on the cross, you declared that all God's laws, prophecies, and promises were completed in you. Your words, it is finished, give us the assurance that our salvation is carried out, that our forgiveness is won, and that heaven belongs to us. It was your Father's hands that formed us in the womb. It was your hands that were stretched out for us on the cross. It was the Spirit that handed your salvation to us in baptism. On the cross, you commended your Spirit into your Father's hands. Because of the cross, your Father is also our Father. Help us also to pray to him with confidence, and on our last day, commit our Spirit into his almighty and loving hands. As Jesus hung on the cross, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. In Jesus, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Christ alone.
First, I'd like to extend a special thank you to all who helped provide musical and visual enhancements for our service today, all who helped with supporting with ushering and setup and those kinds of things. And back in the AV booth, thank you for every, everyone for your help using your gifts to God's glory. Then I'd like to announce that on Easter Sunday, our services are at 7 and 10 a.m., and the Easter breakfast will be served from about 8.15 until 9.15. God's richest blessings on the rest of your Good Friday.